Hi, welcome today to Chapter 3 of the Barron's AP Economics book. My name is Dylan, and I will be outlining the important stuff you need to know in this chapter for the AP exam, both micro and macro, and I'll be explaining each concept in depth. Here's what you need to know for this chapter. You need to know the three main types of economic systems, a command economy, capitalism, and a mix, what a mixed economy is. You also need to know what price determination is, what an equilibrium price is, what demand and supply curves look like, and some determinants of both. You also need to know what a circular flow diagram is and what allocative efficiency is. So there are three main types of economic systems that you need to know. Um, the first is just called a command economy. In a command economy, the government controls everything. They decide what is being produced, how much is being produced, who gets what, everything. And you've probably already heard of two types of it. It's called communism and socialism. The second type is called capitalism. In capitalism, the market determines prices, quantities, and who gets what without governments at all. These prices coordinate the economy, and the controllers, the controls of this economy, are consumers. They're able to achieve allocative efficiency because consumers work together to produce the right amount of goods and services. The last type of economy is called mixed economy. And it's when the government com uses its commands and combines it with capitalism. These government commands are used when free markets break down. Um, most economies are mixed, and we will be studying capitalism and how government commands will affect the economy. Usually the government will intervene whenever the free market cannot provide something or provides too little of it. And so in a capitalist economy, the prices of goods are determined by the supply and the demand of the good. The demand of the good is the consumer's desire to pay for the product. The supply of the good is the producer's willingness to supply the product. And so there are two laws that are absolutely crucial to understand for econ. The law of demand states that when the price of the good increases, the quantity of demand it decreases. It's actually pretty simple to understand. If an apple were to cost $100, I wouldn't want to buy a lot, but if it were 10 cents, I would buy a lot. This would cause the demand graph to be downward sloping because the higher the price, the less people buy. The law of supply states that when the price of the good increases, the quantity supplied increases. <clears throat> Again with the apple, if the apple was $100 and I were a company, I would want to sell a ton of them. But if the apple was only 10 cents, I would only sell a few of them. And so this causes the graph to be upward sloping. As the higher the gr price, the more product is being supplied. It's also very important to know how to graph a demand curve and a supply curve. As I said earlier, the demand is out downward sloping and the supply is upward sloping. So I'm going to quickly draw a graph here and see this is the y-axis to the x-axis. And so this is my demand. This is downward sloping because right here, this is a very high price. Well, price is on the y-axis and quantity is on the x-axis. So this is downward sloping because the high, the high price, I would only want to buy a little and at a low price I want to buy a lot. And this this is the supply graph. At a high price I want to sell a lot, but at a low price I only sell a little. And the reason why the quantity is the, on the x-axis is because price is determined by quantity. Just think about it this way. If it were drought, the lack of water would cause less crops to be produced, and then the shorter shortage of crops would raise the prices. And so in this case, quantity changes price. And so make, make sure you label your curves as well. So this is the supply curve, this is the demand curve. And so the right, the intersection between the two, the intersection right here, this is called the equilibrium. So you want to draw a dotted line over to the x-axis, and this is the equilibrium price. And, and this right here is the equilibrium quantity. So I'll explain both in the next section. As I said earlier, the equilibrium price is where the supply and the demand curves intersect. It's like a market-tested perfect price and perfect quantity. Think about it this way. If the price of a good is not currently at equilibrium, it will return there in the long run. Let's say I'm Coca-Cola and I'm selling soda for $20. Not many people want to buy it, and so they have too much soda they have. So which means they have to lower the price. And they have to keep doing this until they can sell just the right amount. And where the, the people, how much the people want to buy is equal to how much Coca-Cola wants to sell. If the price is too low, I don't, there'll be too many people who want Coca-Cola, and I won't have enough. And I can just keep raising the price until I reach the perfect, perfect amount. And then this achieves allocated efficiency, where just the right amount of goods are being sold at the right price. 
However, these this equilibrium price that I was talking about is dependent on the supply and demand not changing. If it does change, this will change the equilibrium price. So I'm going to draw another supply and demand graph. So here's our y-axis, here's our x-axis. This is price, y-axis, quantity on the x-axis. So this is your supply graph, this is a demand graph. We will D S. So this is your equilibrium price, equilibrium quantity. Now, the equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity are subject to change. It's not always constant. Right now, this is the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity for this demand and supply graph. But let's say the demand changes. Let's say the demand increases, so which means I need to shift the demand right. This is, going to be a, this is the new demand graph. This is the graph after the shift. And so this will change your supply, your equilibrium and quantity and equilibrium price. And this will change it to where the new demand graph intersects the old supply graph. So this is your equilibrium quantity one, because that's the new one, and equilibrium price one. Now let's say your supply also changes. In which you, this case, the new equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity is where the new supply graph, your new supply graph intersects your new demand graph. So right here, this is your equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity. This is the final equilibrium quantity and equilibrium price at their two at their demand shift and a supply shift. As I was talking about earlier, the equilibrium price can change if the demand curve shifts. Now the demand curve can only shift if one of the determinants of demand changes. This will cause the whole curve to shift, not just along a different point on the same curve. So these include the changes in consumer taste, basically that people suddenly like or don't like a good, and then the whole demand for it will change. Or the prices of substitute goods change. So if the phones are substitute for tablets, and the price of phones increases, the demand for tablets will increase. This is because people don't want to buy phones anymore, because they can just substitute it with tablets. Um, consumer expectations. Basically, people expectations for the price of a good in the future. If people expect the price of corn to rise in the future, they will buy more now, and the demand will increase now. Income. If people make more money, the demand increases. Prices of complementary goods change. Let's say soda is a complement to popcorn. This means people will usually buy both if they buy one. If the price of soda increases, the quantity for soda will change. Demanded quantities demanded for soda will change, but the demand curve for soda won't change. However, since the price of soda changes and soda is a complementary good for popcorn, the whole demand for popcorn will decrease. This is because people buy less soda, and as a result, they buy less popcorn. Remember that price changes of good don't change the curve; they only move to a different point along the curve. However, these pri these same price changes can affect the overall demand for a different good. The same idea with supply. Supply can only change if one of the determinants of supply changes. However, the determinants are different for supply. For example, the first one, product input prices. If it costs more to make a good, supply will decrease. Technology and productivity. If the technology or productivity gets better, supply will increase because they can produce more goods now. Taxes and subsidies. If the government's taxes is a good, the supply for the good will decrease because producers will make money. If the government subsidizes a good, the supply will increase because the companies will get money from the government for producing that good. Number of firms. If the number of firms increases, the supply will increase. Expected future price. If the suppliers expect the price of corn to rise, they will sell less now and more later. Therefore, supply will decrease now. Also remember that changes in price don't affect the supply curve, just the quantity supplied. Know that decreases in supply and demand are shifts to the left, and increases in either are shifts to the right. The last topic I'll be covering today is called the circular flow diagram. In the circular flow diagram, it models the flow of resources and money. So there are four main entities here. You have sort of like the markets for like factors of production, the markets for like goods and services, businesses and firms, and then you have households. And then you have two arrows. One kind of models money, and the other one models inputs and outputs. So let's just start with the green arrow. Right here, firms pay wages, rent, and profit to markets, and like to market markets, markets for factors of production. They need labor, they need land, they need capital, and they buy it from the market. And in turn, the market provides households with income because households are the ones who 
are the ones providing the land labor capital, and the markets give them income in return for it. Households then spend that income on goods and services, which provides revenue for firms. The other error goes the other way. Um, households provide markets for, with, for fa factors of productions with land, labor, and capital, as I said earlier, and they provide factors of productions for firms, and firms provide the markets for goods and services with goods and services, and then these sell them to the households. It's pretty simple, but it's an important topic that you should know for the AP exam. That's it for this chapter. Thank you for watching, and I hope you learned something.